The draft is now four days away. We've covered what the Pacers did on draft night and how their best pick can help the team. But what does it mean for the rest of the roster and free agency, which starts in only five days? We'll break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today, we are talking more about the draft, but also about how the draft ties into the Pacers' current roster and upcoming free agency period. Free eight, The draft just finished, but free agency starts in just four days now. It's the 27th. It starts basically on the 30th. So in four days, the Pacers will still be making moves and changing up their team. So there will be time to cover these draft players, especially around Summer League. we got to pivot into this transition as the Pacers continue to reshape their roster. So I've divided the segments into guards, forwards, and centers today and broken down, I think, the key points to me at least in terms of what the Pacers draft means and what it could mean for the vets on their roster or their free agency plans at that position. I've already run through free agency at every position. If you want to listen to those podcasts, looking at what the Pacers could consider at those spots, but now that the draft is in the rear view mirror and the Pacers have actually picked players at certain positions, we can run through what it means for the roster and for free agency coming up. We'll be here all week talking free agency with various guests as well. You won't want to miss any of that. Let's start with the guards though, like I said, and this was interesting because heading into this draft, the Pacers already had Tyrese Halberton and TJ McConnell, and Malcolm Brogdon, and Chris Duarte, and Buddy Heald, and Dwayne Washington. They had six guards, and the top of this draft had some wing guard hybrid types, so it would be natural for the Pacers to end up with one of them. But still, despite having those six guards already on the team, the Pacers picked two more in this draft. You can call Mather in a wing. I have myself. He could play the three. That's fine. I think at the two is where he'll at least start his growth in the NBA. So that's already very confusing to me. So I think the first takeaway on the Pacers roster I have from this draft is there's a lot of unclear guard roles. And I have four names I typed down, but I want to run through, you know, there's 14 guys who will right now stand to look like they will be under contract in some form with the Pacers this next season, right? And maybe they trade Brogdon, maybe they trade Turner, maybe they trade Heald, maybe they trade McConnell, any of the vets that are over a certain age, maybe Goga gets traded. You know, there's a lot of names that could be on the move. But just looking at the guys they have right now, right? Halliburton would start at the one, Brogdon at the two, McConnell's your backup one, Matherin's your backup two. Maybe you start Matherin over Brogdon, whatever. Those are still your four rotation guards. They still have Nembard, who they picked, Dwayne Washington, who's young and just had a nice rookie season. And I pushed Duarte as the starting three. So now Buddy Heald's your backup three. As you just saw me describe, or heard me describe, there's some confusion. I highlighted names I thought were in a confusing role, given what the Pacers roster is. Brogdon starting at the two or backing up, whatever, if you want to start Matherin. Nembard in the third string role. Buddy Heald at the backup three. All those, while not terrible on their own, are weird. They're a little off. And so, especially with Dwayne Washington not playing, what's McConnell's role? Because they just drafted Nembard. How does Brogdon fit into this? There's a lot of unclear guard roles right now in the Pacers. That's not to say everything is out of whack or anything. But it does seem like that is where, as free agency starts, the Pacers are ripe for a move of some kind, shedding a guard, forcing them in another position, or shedding a guard just for raw picks in return. Because right now, the logjam that already existed before the draft is still there and in stronger terms, right? And, you know, Nembard especially, they just picked him 31. Like, I'm not saying a guy picked 31 should be jumping in as your backup right away, but as a rebuilding team who maybe isn't going to jump right into the playoffs, you'd like to find that guy a minute somewhere. If he's already behind Halliburton and McConnell, plus Brogdon might play the one a little bit. Dwayne Washington might sneak in that rotation. Ben Matherin, Duarte, Heald all on the team. How's he going to play? And 31 isn't a guy who should play a lot. Last year's 31st pick didn't play very much at all for the Wizards. Only 12 games, I think, played for Isaiah Todd last year. That's abnormally low, though. Looking at Nembard, there's got to be a way to at least get him to where he's the first guy that plays if there's an injury or something like that. And right now, he's not even close to that. So that makes me think... A shakeup could happen in the guard spot with that. And he's he's talented enough to maybe play a little bit. Again, it's a rebuilding team. But that one stood out to me as a weird one. And so, look, they had Aaron Holiday on the team. And he barely played even after two years. When they signed McConnell, they they jumped. To, Nate, Nate McMillan put McConnell over Aaron Holiday in the rotation in like the third game of the season. And that was Aaron Holiday's second season. 
That felt weird at the time. It ended up being the right choice. But, you know, those kind of things suggest that, yeah, maybe Nembard won't be a guy in the rotation day one, but certainly not the seventh or eighth guard on the team. So I would say in terms of roster impact on the draft at the guard spot, because they drafted Matherin, because they drafted Nembard, two guards who are going to be, in Matherin's case, definitely playing, and in Nembard's case, on the fringes of playing, there's a, a huge logjam that somehow needs to be sorted out. And so I wouldn't say it's necessarily – Bad for any one individual besides Brogdon. I still think Brogdon gets traded. And the draft wasn't impactful on Brogdon getting traded. I think that was going to be the case anyway. But for guys like Dwayne Washington, whose contract is still not technically guaranteed next season, for a guy like Buddy Heald, who's good and talented and was useful on the Pacers last year, but maybe isn't in their really long-term future plans, for a guy like TJ McConnell, you know, maybe they become a little bit more expendable or movable in some way if the Pacers need to free up their guard spots in a better way to allocate those minutes around. Even if you get cut bait with some of those guys or all of them, you could sign a, a deep bench, a deep bench vet if you need to for certain reasons. So, you know, I think that that is the most interesting storyline in general from every position to be from the draft is how are the Pacers going to clear up this guard log jam? Because if they are going to be rebuilding and playing the young guys, they have a lot of them. And I, I put, put Duarte at the three for this exercise, but you can even call him a guard too. You know, Halliburton, Matherin, Nembard, Washington, Duarte. That's a five young guards already. It's going to be very complicated for the Pacers to sort this out. And that's why Brogdon is the obvious one. But I think it's possible there's multiple trades involving guards for the Pacers or multiple moves, whether that's a waiver or something like that, because they've got a lot to sort out at that position. So continuing through that, not a good night, as me and Mark Schindler talked about on the bonus podcast last weekend. Draft night, not a good night for Lance Stevenson. And I'm not going to say, no, there's no way they bring him back because as a fan favorite and as that vet guard I just described, if there's two moves or something that they could use even behind a guy like Nembard, yeah, Lance Lance makes a lot of sense. Maybe he deserves that glory roster spot just for his fan favorite at this stage of his career. He can play one, two, or even three. That versatility is really nice because they have no one at forwards. I'm not ruling anything out for Lance Stevenson. But they already went from a spot where Bringing Lance back was a tough allocation of resources because they had six guards. Now they have eight, maybe more, if you count Duarte as a guard, right? They have a ton of guards right now, and free agency hasn't even started. They don't even have a full roster yet. They've actually signed a couple Exhibit 10 guards as well, right? They are really filled up at those spots. So if you're Lance Stevenson, draft night was not good for you. I'm not saying the door is closed on a Lance Stevenson reunion with the Pacers next season. He did come back this past season and play. Honestly, some of the best point guard basketball of his career, like since his first stint with the Pacers. But drafting two guards definitely is not helpful for him if you would like to return. And if you're Lance and you want to be back with the Pacers, then what you would like to see in his shoes is a Brogdon trade very early in free agency and probably either a Buddy Heald or a TJ McConnell trade as well, just so there is at least one tangible, this makes sense for the Pacers guard roster spot. Not a good night for him. And Buddy Heald's a guy I want to talk about here too. Not as bad of a day as Lance. One, he's already under contract for three more seasons still, of course. So he's not obviously super worried about anything. He'll get paid his money either way. He's on a team. But, you know, the only way that I – like he's one of the Pacers' best eight players still, even after the draft. That seems like a guy who should play, but they are a rebuilding team, so maybe not. The only way I could find a spot for him that made any sense was back up three. That's fine. He's a shooter. He can play the three. He can't play guard threes, though. You know, his role is really unclear at this stage. Because Halliburton, Nembard, Brogdon, Matherin, McConnell, Duarte, that's a ton of guys at your 1-2 spots already. So I, moving Duarte and Heald to the 3 cleared that up a little bit. And the Pacers have no 3s. So I think the fact that Buddy Heald's only spot is the backup 3 is both reflective of how big of a logjam the Pacers have at guard and how poor the Pacers' current wings are. And that should be a priority for this team entering free agency. So... Not a bad day for Buddy Heald, but definitely a, a, a negative day for him. You know, his role might be different or a little out of position. And you know, for a guy on a bloated contract and not perfectly within the Pacers' age range, yes, he was good for the Pacers last year, played in every game, is a solid bet, is friends with Tyrese. These are all great skills. And if they keep him, it would make sense to me. But given what the Pacers roster looks like, given what these guard roles are, it might be hard to find the perfect role for him that allows him to be as good as he was last year, that allows him to be the best version of himself and make sense for a guy making as much money as he does. Remember, he'd be making nearly $20 million next season. That's a, a lot of money to pay a guy to be a reserve guard, right? That's part of the issue with Brogdon. Even as a starter, he doesn't play enough, so his contract becomes a little debilitating at times. And so 
though you know the money roll situation will be confusing for Brogdon, of course, and I don't think the draft changes anything. I still think they're going to trade him. But for Buddy, a guy who plays a lot and his only flaw is that he's overpaid, you know, it's still a little tough for him now because there's not an obvious fit on where he could be without a lot in a similar situation to other players I've named without two or three other moves or some slotting around of players. So maybe you disagree with some of where I put guys in a fake rotation and doing that exercise is sort of silly before free agency, but it is a way to show, okay, what do the Pacers need? Where do these players slide in? How can a rotation even be built? What do they need? They do not need guards right now. So if you're a guy like Lance Stevenson, who's a free agent after last year with the Pacers, not a good day for you. Same with even Gabe York and Nate Hinton, the two-way guys. You know, there are a lot of guards on the Pacers right now. Ricky Rubio, I mean, I don't think he'd be back anyway. But you know, those guys, even less likely they are back than before the draft started. And I think that's why guard trades are possible in a position they should target if they can in a guard forward trade. Obviously, as a forward, specifically a small forward, let's pivot and talk about what the forward spot could look like or do, does look like now that the draft is over for the Pacers. Before we do that, really quickly, I want to talk to you guys about betonline.net, your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball, all over at betonline.net. Stanley Cup Final Game 6 happening right now, and BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. They've got lines up for NFL openers already, if you're interested in them. The Colts' first game of the season, they play in Houston against the Texans on September 11th. Colts favored by eight. I have seen the Colts have a dud or two in their opening night games, but the Texans also stink. If you're interested in that line, you can get it over at BetOnline.net. The fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports, that's BetOnline.net, where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, go check out Locked On NBA to hear the latest and greatest news around the league as they cover everything that's happened from free agency, draft, the latest buzz. It's all a busy time these days around the league as rosters change and free agency is setting to ramp up. We'll cover that all later this week. The 29th, Wednesday, two days from now, is the decision date deadline for O'Shea Brissett's team option. Big decision for the Pacers. Qualifying offers are due that day. That's when everything really starts with free agency starting the next day. Official, let's talk about what the draft meant for the forward position for the Pacers. Hey, you could call Ben Mather in a forward, and I would not fight you on it. I've called him a wing myself. Perhaps the Pacers got a three there. Perhaps the draft means Chris Duarte moves to the three. Either way, I think that one of those two guys is going to be playing on the three spot, Duarte or Matherin, pretty often this coming season. I think it should be Duarte. I think he's a more natural fit at that spot with his skill set. I will not fight hard with anyone who says Matherin should be that guy. It doesn't really matter to me. Positions don't super matter when you're differentiating. It's ball handlers, wings, and bigs. Those two guys can be wings or ball handlers, whatever. But the Pacers drafted one natural, air quotes, forward. That's Kendall Brown from Baylor, a guy I quite liked before the draft. If you listen to my big board episode three days before the draft, Kendall Brown in my top 20. I'm quite a fan of his game. That said, the history of the 40th pick matters and where he slots in the rotation and how he slots in on this team. So when I dive through the forward spots, trying to get guys in the right spot, and I'll tell you the names I highlighted as that felt a little out of whack because I did that at the guard spots too. I put Duarte currently pre-free agency, Duarte is the Pacers' starting three. O'Shea Brissett is the starting four. Buddy Heald is the backup three. Isaiah Jackson is the backup four. That's one that I highlighted, as well as Buddy Heald I mentioned earlier. And then Kendall Brown is the third string three, and Terry Taylor as the third string four. What'd you hear a lot of there? Buddy Heald's a two at the three. Chris Duarte is a two at the three. Isaiah Jackson's a five at the four. Terry Taylor can play any position, but you know nothing is supernatural there for him. He was a five a lot last year. Even with sliding guys into other positions that make a little bit of sense, there's still very, very, very little depth for the Pacers at these forward spots. And that's why, even though they don't have a ton of roster spots left, they've signed some Exhibit 10 guys, they've done the draft, I think forward will be the priority in free agency. Whether that's a stud like Miles Bridges or some other name on the market, or whether that's some littler, littler, that was not a word, whether that's some smaller moves, you know, your Torian Princes, your Lonnie Walkers, I think that's a position that they will be targeting because they need guys who naturally fit those spots. And not to say the names that I just said are bad or totally terrible ideas for the Pacers as they kind of bridge season into a new era. 
but it is definitely a position they need to address just for depth in general. So they're not relying on some of these deep spots. So I think that the first takeaway I had is something I mentioned earlier, and that's that Duarte or Matherin is going to be the starting three, as of now at least, when opening night happens. And if they sign a stud three, one of Duarte or Matherin is coming off the bench anyway, maybe both. So that is something to monitor is how those slots all figure out. And Brogdon being traded would certainly – Change that up, and he is the best trade chip the Pacers have to getting this starting three. I think that's important to note because the Pacers do have the option of trading him into a team with space, into the space, and just getting picks back or something like that. But they could also trade him for salary in a in a trade that matches salary and pick up a, a forward that way that could slot into their rotation a little more naturally than anyone they have right now. So that's my first takeaway: is the starting three spot between the guards air quote that they have will probably be as it stands right now a guard, and if they don't sign someone that's going to be how the season starts between Buddy Heald, Matherin, and Duarte. Number two, great draft night for O'Shea Brissett. Great draft night for him. Kendall Brown is not ready to be a rotation guy in year one, most likely. He's also not really a four. He's probably big enough to do it, I would say, but he's not bulky, if that makes sense. Uh, and I like Kendall Brown. I think he's going to be good. But, you know, at his size, he is tall. He's 6'8", but he's just barely over 200 pounds. He will struggle, especially with those bigger fours. So I think he's more natural at the three right away, and he could transition there. Either way, no fours were added to the team on draft night. Maybe that's something that happens in a trade. But the Pacers' best options at backup four right now are a guy they picked 48th in Kendall Brown, Isaiah Jackson, Terry Taylor, who's a 6'5 guy who's best at the five. O'Shea Brissett is the most natural four on the team. He was before the draft, and he still is after the draft. He definitely had a good draft night for his ability to negotiate with the Pacers in his upcoming free agency, should he become a free agent. He has a team option due on Wednesday. I've done a whole podcast talking about this, what the pros and cons are. The Pacers could accept it, have O'Shea Brissett on the minimum this coming season, and then he's an unrestricted free agent next offseason, or they decline his team option, give him a qualifying offer, and he's a restricted free agent this offseason right now, and they could renegotiate a little more pricey deal now, but they guarantee they keep him in restricted free agency that's what the Pacers will have to decide. I think they should give him a longer deal in restricted free agency and because they'll need him in the rotation after a draft where they didn't really get a four. I think he's in a position to say, hey, you know, I could be playing big minutes for this team. We talked to Rick Carlisle about him uh, at the draft presser. Scott Agnes and I were talking to him. And O'Shea seems like, a, a, you know, has always seemed this way. But Rick said, yeah, he, you know, we, we should have this guy back. I like O'Shea Brissett. I think he's good and young and on our timeline. You know, that's paraphrasing. That's not the full quote. But it did seem like Carlisle thinks O'Shea Brissett will be on this team this year. That will be an upcoming piece for me. Looking ahead at the Pacers for agency period. So good good night for O'Shea Brissett. It was a good chance at starting as of now. And depending on what the Brogdon trade return is, assuming such a trade happens. Again, I could be off here. Uh, but I think he will still be dealt. Depending on the Brogdon trade return or how free agency goes, he's got a good shot at some pretty big minutes this coming season. Kendall Brown, next guy I want to talk about takeaways for. He could actually get a roster spot, and I think that's noteworthy because going back through the history of the 48th pick, last year it was Sharif Cooper. He went to Atlanta, and they were a contender, but they put him on a two-way deal. They did not give him an NBA contract where he's with the team every day. The year before that, Nico Mannion got picked by Golden State. And both, by the way, both of those guys fell in the draft, and they got two ways from contending teams. Nico Mannion took a two-way with Golden State. So Kendall Brown, going off the last two drafts, Seems like a two-way slot, but the Pacers are not a contending team. And Kendall Brown did fall, not to the extent that maybe those guys did, but close to it, honestly. It's kind of funny how the 48th pick is shaken out that way. I think he could break that trend a little bit. I think he could break that trend a little bit because the Pacers aren't a contending team, but also because they don't have a lot of forward depth. I think that uh, having a, a guy like Brown on the roster full-time could be needed. If you if there's injuries, they'll need somebody to, to slot on in and uh, he, he seems like a guy who could be the, the right name just given what the, the roster is right now. The only four words that are obviously natural forwards on the team right now are Brissett and Terry Taylor. And you can slot Duarte in there and Heald and Jackson, whoever, but they'll need more than that. They will need more than that. And Kendall Brown seems like the most natural fit to just squeeze on up in there. So, uh, you know, Kata Bates Diop got some good money as a 48th pick in 2018. Paul Zipser had a good rookie year as a 48th pick. Like it hasn't been like a bad pick in the past, and some guys have got better deals. But I think that Brown will get above a two-way just because of the Pacers' forward needs. So if you're Kendall Brown and his group, what you're hoping for is not a lot of forward signings for the Pacers in free agency so that you have a chance to return 
Last guy here that I want to bring up, TJ Warren. Look, I don't know what to expect here. I still don't. Um, he is a free agent. Justin Anderson is similar boat, although a much, much worse player in this instance. But because the Pacers didn't draft a forward, if you're a forward free agent for the Pacers, you got to be feeling pretty good about your chances of coming back to the team if you want to. And now TJ Warren is weird. You know, I don't know what the Pacers are thinking with him. I, I, if, if he would be willing to come back on a deal that is pretty team favorable, I think that makes sense for the Pacers. His injury situation obviously makes it confusing. A sign and trade is obviously a, a very appealing option for the Pacers because then they get stuff back for their talented player, even though he didn't play for them for a few years. If the Pacers want him back now, TJ Warren can say, hey, I have an easy rotation spot on this team, uh, and you guys need forwards. So if the Pacers want him back, and TJ Warren truly does want to be back, as he has said in the past, then yeah, I think there's a natural fit there, especially with the need now. But again, his 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 age and skill set, or excuse me, his age mostly uh, makes him an awkward fit. His injury history does as well, but he is really good, and, and having really good wings is very important. So good draft night for TJ Warren in terms of a Pacers perspective, but we'll see what actually happens with him in the free agency period. And Justin Anderson, too, if he's vying for a training camp spot or the 15th guy spot, whatever, a good chance for him there, too. I, I don't know what they're thinking with him, but he was on the team for basically a month this past season, which is quite a bit. He played in quite a few games. He's got a shot to sneak in there as well. So one more position to go, the center spot. Uh, and I think there is a little thing I want to talk about here that was not involved with the Pacers draft, but still have an impact on their free agency because of the draft. So let's talk about that. Before we do that, though, I want to talk to you guys about rockauto.com. We're bringing you this episode with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models of vehicles. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure the pointless and intimidating questioning about the specs of your vehicle, the parts you need, and wait while the guy behind the counter orders it? The only to get the thing their warehouse happens to carry. You got to go back and get it. It's a pain. Just use rockauto.com and avoid that whole process. You can save time and money on Rock Auto and still get everything that you need. They're a family business, serving do it yourself for over 20 years. Their prices are always reliable for every customer. And they have everything you could need brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, new carpet, you name it. They got it. Explore their easy to use website today. Find the solution your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box. So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. I'm going to advise, let's see, Lockdown Pistons. Kook Hill is going to break you down about the team that had my favorite draft and the team we're about to talk about in relation to what it means for the Indiana Pacers. And you'll see why in a moment. So let's talk about the center position for the Pacers. What the draft night mean for the center position less so I think than the forwards and, and guards no centers were drafted by the Pacers so that obviously means there's less impact there uh, I think that's a, a little smile small in holy cow words a small increase in Miles Turner's chances now of staying with the Pacers this season I think they went up a tiny tiny bit because the Pacers didn't draft a center I didn't expect the Pacers to draft a center but if they had that could have tipped they were more likely to trade Turner and I still think they're more likely than not to not trade Turner this year, despite some of the reporting. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter what I think or don't think. Uh, but I think his chances went up ever so slightly. He's still only 26, would still slot in nicely as this team starter. They didn't draft the center. If Isaiah Jackson truly is the backup four, they only have Turner and Goga. I think it was a good night for Miles and his chance to stay with the Pacers, assuming he would like to, stay, to remain an Indiana Pacer. I think the chances he's traded went down ever so slightly. And speaking of guys on the roster, Goga Batadze has to feel pretty good about how draft night went as well. Because if the rotation is kind of shaken out like I described, and Isaiah Jackson slots in at the backup four because they need someone to play that spot, Goga's now your backup five. This is That'll be the first time he opening night opportunity, backup center, he can play it. And maybe he gets it, maybe he doesn't. Depends on how free agency goes. But as of now, after draft night, Goga has to feel a little bit better about what his role could look like on the Pacers this next season. He would certainly be the first big to play after injuries, which was not necessarily even the case last season, you know, with guys like Jalen Smith and Isaiah Jackson skirting on in there. So Terry Taylor is now your emergency big again, which is good for him. And he's already got money guaranteed. I'm almost certain he'll be back with the team this next season. Every center or a prospective center guy who's searching for minutes on this Pacers team has to be pretty happy with how the draft shook out for them and how their minutes could be impacted by the draft, but there's not a lot of analysis here. Those guys were already pretty secure in their spots in general, and the Pacers not drafting anyone really cemented that. They're locked in. 
these roles seem more obvious. A Turner trade would make it just Isaiah Jackson slots down to the center spot. Him and Goga are running that spot. Maybe they trade Goga, then they need to sign someone. But either way, there's not going to be too much dynamic movement at that spot because they didn't draft someone. The opinions you had of these Pacers centers before the draft are likely the same as what you have after. The big impact on the center position for the Pacers came not from anything the Pacers did on draft night, but rather what some other teams did on draft night. Let's talk about Jalen Smith. We asked Rick Carlisle about him in that aforementioned media availability. Like I said, at the press conference, Rick Carlisle beaming. Uh, He said he loves Jalen Smith, loves teaching Jalen Smith and working with Jalen Smith. And so, yes, there are huge hurdles for the Pacers to keep Jalen Smith. They can only offer him 4.7 million ish this coming season. Other teams can offer him more. He was very good for the Pacers, and his value might be higher now. Tenth overall pick a couple years ago. So it makes sense that some other teams would try to pursue him, and they could give him more than the Pacers. And then the following year, once again, the Pacers would be limited in what they could give him, while other teams could still beat them. So it's very hard for the Pacers to keep Jalen Smith. They still could, but not ruling it out. And if you are someone who's rooting for Jalen Smith to return to the Pacers and sort of disrupt the center rotation I just described. Draft night went well for you and that sort of thinking. First over, or excuse me, teams that I thought are sort of in need of a center and have cap space. The Oklahoma City Thunder are one of them. They picked second overall and they picked Chad Holmgren, right? That is, uh, let me Google all the cap space teams. Uh, But he, by picking, or Holmgren, by going to OKC, will likely slide in as their starting center immediately. Which makes a lot of sense, right? Why wouldn't he? They picked him number two overall. They're a young team. He can grow at their core. Another team with cap space heading into this year would be the Detroit Pistons, who made a big trade to get Jalen Duren on draft night. And they now have at least a potential starting center by grabbing Duren. That's a big time for the Pacers. The Magic, they already have Wendell Carter. They have Mo Bon. These are, you know, these are cap space teams. The Magic, uh, they pick Van Caro, who's going to play in their front court. They have Bamba as a free agent. They have Wendell Carter already on their team. They seem a little more set at the center spot. The Pacers have the space. The Spurs have cap space. They have Jakob Pertl on their team. They have Zach Collins on their team. They're not as center needy as some of these other teams. So the two teams with cap space that needed a center were Detroit and OKC. And OKC's cap space won't even be that big. And they both picked a center on draft night. The Blazers are still a threat here a little bit, I would say, if you're the Pacers, because they're going to have some space to do some damage this summer. Who knows what their big plans are? They picked Shaden Sharp in the first round. They could still be a threat to lure in Jalen Williams to that team. But the big takeaways are the the two teams that could get to cap space pretty easily so that would need a big-time center or have minutes there for Detroit and OKC, and they both drafted good centers that will play big minutes for them. They might not be as interested in giving big resources into the center spot anymore. So there are every team in the league has some exception, the room exception, the non-tax pyramid level, the tax pyramid level, whatever. They don't, they don't have to use it. Maybe they're pre- prevented from using it, but there are still ways that these teams could beat the Pacers offer for Jalen Smith. But the cap space team is the one that could give him a big pay bump now will need a center even less. So that is definitely an advantage for the Pacers. Even though they can't offer them the most money, they can still say, hey, we didn't draft a four. We have room for you there. We could slot you in ahead of Goga as a backup five if we want to do that because you were really good for us. They can offer him that opportunity now that he described that he needed in his next team in his exit interview. And there are fewer teams, in my opinion, that will be chasing his services. So yes, any team in the league could still give him an exception deal above what the Pacers could pay him. And I think that means I still would lean away from the fact that Jalen Smith will return to the Pacers. I still think it's more likely than not he does not return to Indiana. But I think the odds that he returns to the Pacers goes up after the draft. Not because the Pacers did anything at center, although them not picking someone is part of this calculus, but mostly because other teams that did need centers and have resources there did in fact take someone at that spot. And that should be helpful for the Pacers in any negotiations they can have. Their negotiations are basically just, hey, this is the role we have for you. Please take all of our money and funds. But that is it. They, they now have, I think, a slightly better shot at that. And that was a pretty big draft ripple effect to me is that both Detroit and OKC walked away with a big because the other cap space teams already are there 
And there's only about five cap space teams this summer. So Portland's a big threat. And really every team has these exceptions that make them possible. But they're all over the cap and have resources at the five already. So good night for the Pacers if they would like to keep Jalen Smith. Or if you're a fan of Jalen Smith, it was a good night for you as well. So that is to me how the draft has its ripple effects on the roster and what it could mean for this team. It's free agency opens up this week. That's what we'll be talking about every day this week on this podcast. Tomorrow, we'll talk about free agency as a whole. I'll probably have a guest on. Talk about some big storylines to look out for, what positions they could go for, what trades they could make, things like that. Wednesday, we'll talk about the option decision for Brissett a little bit and what those could look like around the league, how that could impact what the Pacers could do. Thursday, we'll review those decisions, talk a little more about rumors and free agency. And Friday, boom, we're off and going. We'll talk all about it and break down the new look Pacers on the Lockdown Pacers podcast. It's what we do. Hope you all had a good weekend and enjoyed thinking more about the New Look Pacers after their new draft picks. We'll, of course, continue to dive in to the New Look Pacers as this week goes on. Thank you all so much for listening. You can follow me on Twitter if you think I said something dumb at TEastNBA and yell at me there. Or this podcast at Lockdown Pacers. We're also on YouTube if you'd like to see my face as I remain going through, remain, as I rumble through all of these thoughts. So thank you all so much for listening on whatever platform you're listening on. Have a great rest of your day and we will see you tomorrow.